Hello, I'm Professor David O'Connell and the Political Science Department, Assistant Professor of Political Science. I'm talking to you today from my office in the basement of Denny Hall. Uh, perhaps you visited Denny Hall when you were a student here or if you were a parent, you've been there with your child. Uh, so thank you for tuning in today. What I would like to do for you, uh, the plan is that I'm going to walk you through as the title of the presentation suggests five things I think you need to know about congressional elections. And these points are points of information they're based on political science research that I think you can use to understand not only this current cycle, but congressional elections in the future. So I imagine that'll take about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, and then you can type questions throughout. They'll appear at the bottom of my screen. I'm new to this technology, so I will try to manage this as best I can, uh, but I'll be happy to try to answer those questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, and I'm an American politics generalist, so you can feel free to ask anything about the state of American politics today, not just about congressional elections. And so the first point that I wanted to make about congressional elections, the first of the five things you need to know is that the president's party always loses seats in a midterm election. The president's party always loses seats in a midterm election. So any talk about a red wave in 2018 where the Republicans would pick up seats in the House of Representatives has no empirical basis. If we look at the history of congressional mid, uh, midterm elections since the um, end of World War II, what we would see is that there have only been two occasions when the president's party has actually picked up seats. That would be 1998, you have Democratic President Bill Clinton, and so the Democrats should have lost seats, uh, but actually they picked up a few, and that was clearly a reaction to impeachment. Uh, Clinton maintained uh, approval ratings over 60% over the 14 months uh, that people were investigating his relationship with Monica Lewinsky and allegations that he had obstructed justice and perjured himself. Uh, he never lost his public support. Impeachment was very unpopular. And as a result, the Republican Party missed an opportunity to gain seats in that midterm election. 2002, uh, the Republican President George Bush, his party should have lost seats in that midterm election, and they actually picked up a few seats as well. And that's a clear result of 9-11. After 9-11, George Bush receives a rally around the flag effect that boosts his approval ratings up over 90%. He becomes the most popular president in American political history. And by the time that midterm election rolls around a year later, he's still extraordinarily popular. And more to the point, the Republican Party in general has a substantial advantage on national security issues, which was a substantial advantage for their party when they're running in an election a year after a terrorist attack. Uh, and so absent those extraordinarily unusual conditions, impeachment, a terrorist attack, the president's party loses seats. And we're talking about the House of Representatives here, of course, because only a third of the Senate is up for election every two years. And so Senate fluctuations can be, can be different. Now, why the president's party always loses seats isn't necessarily agreed upon, although there are a couple of explanations that political scientists tend to center on. So one is the simple idea of coattails, uh, that when the president is on the ballot, when there's a presidential election, you see more peripheral voters turn up to cast their ballot. And these are individuals who don't have strong partisan opinions. Uh, they don't um, participate often. They don't have a lot of information about politics. And as a result, they're more likely to be caught up in the tides of the moment, swing to the president's winning candidate's party uh, down the ticket. Uh, and so you can imagine in 2008, Barack Obama pulled a lot of Democrats into office with him. But then in the midterm election, you only have core voters, people who participate regularly. We're talking turnout of 35 to 40 percent. Uh, these individuals have strong partisan identities. They have high amounts of political information. And as a result, by default, the president's party loses votes that they picked up just two years earlier. Now, this explanation accounts for one of the fundamental regularities of congressional elections where a big presidential victory is often followed by big midterm losses. Again, returning to that Obama example, 2008, he wins a pretty sizable victory by modern standards, 53 to 46% in the popular vote. And then in 2010, the Democrats are going to lose 63 seats. 2012, he wins much more narrowly, only winning about 51 to 48 over Mitt Romney. And the Democrats accordingly lose fewer seats in 2014, just about 13 seat swing. Uh, another explanation for the president's party always losing seats is that voters use the midterm as a referendum on the president. 
Uh, and even though all presidents begin office, other than Donald Trump, who did not receive a honeymoon effect and started at about 45% approval, 47% disapproval, other than that, all presidents have begun their term with a high amount of public support. So Barack Obama begins in the polls at 68%, but they quickly lose that support because once you begin making decisions and using your executive powers, it's inevitable that you disappoint people. Uh, and then people use the midterm as an opportunity to express their discontent. This explanation is particularly good for understanding large midterm losses for unpopular presidents with bad economies. And the third explanation for midterm loss would be just voters engaging in balancing. If you're trying to achieve balance, partisan balance in government, you can't really do that in a presidential election because you don't know for certain who's going to win. But in the midterm, you know now that Donald Trump, a Republican, is the president. And so if you want to check him by strengthening the Democratic Party, you have the opportunity to do so. And we have evidence that a substantial number of Americans would be this sophisticated in their voting behavior. Cognitive Madisonians, we might call them. So that's the first point. Second thing you need to know about congressional elections is that the Republicans have a natural advantage in midterm elections. The Republicans have a natural advantage in midterm elections. And so that's really due to the inefficient geographic distribution of Democratic votes. I don't think it would surprise anyone who's listening when I say that the Democrats have become the party of urban America and the Republicans have become the party of rural and suburban America. That wasn't always the case. If I showed you a graph that looked at the population density by county, and compared that, or related that, I should say, to the performance of Dwight Eisenhower in 1952, you would see that Eisenhower did quite well in urban areas across America. He won many of the most urban counties in the United States by large margins. But now, if we were to look at that graph in 2012 or 2016, you see almost a linear relationship. The more densely populated a county becomes, the more likely that county is to overwhelmingly support a Democratic candidate. And the problem for the Democrats then is that that doesn't describe most areas of the United States of America. There are far more congressional districts that are gonna be found in rural areas and suburban areas. And so if we look at the partisan lean of congressional districts across the country, and we would define a district as leaning to either the Republican or Democrats, Republicans or Democrats, by a simple standard. If that district voted for the Republican presidential candidate by two points more than the national average over the last two presidential elections, we would consider that a Republican leaning district. If we looked at districts that voted for the Democratic candidate by two points more than the national average over the last two elections, we would consider that a Democratic leaning district. So if we break the districts down by that standard, we see that across the United States of America consistently over the last 10 to 20 years, about 51 to 52 percent of House districts lean to the Republican Party, about 41 to 42 percent of districts lean to the Democratic Party, and the rest are competitive. So the implications for the Democrats are pretty clear. The Republicans can hold the House of Representatives simply by winning those districts that naturally favor their candidates. For the Democrats to win the House of Representatives, they need to win all districts that favor Democrats, they need to win all the competitive districts, and then they need to win a few Republican districts as well, a task that has become increasingly difficult as the uh, predictive power of partisanship in explaining people's individual voting decisions has gone up over time uh, to an all-time high, so that now, if you look at recent congressional elections, we're only going to see a handful of Democrats who are able to win in a Republican-leaning district, a handful of Republicans who are, willing, are able to win in a Democratic-leaning district. So that's point two. Republicans have a natural advantage in midterm elections because of the inefficient geographic distribution of Democratic votes. Point three is that it's really hard to be an incumbent member of Congress. So there's this fundamental uh, surprising aspect of American politics. When you look at opinion polls, it shows that only about 10 to 20 percent of people in recent years have been willing to approve of Congress's performance. But at the same time, since World War II, 93 percent of members of the House of Representatives have gone on to win re-election, then 80 percent of senators have gone on to win re-election. Now, that's, those statistics are excluding people who didn't run because potentially they lost a primary, or they retired, or they resigned due to a scandal. Some of those people very well may have lost had they stood for re-election. But at the end of the day, 
90% of congressional elections are going to feature an incumbent candidate, and the vast majority of those incumbents are going to go on to win re-election. The reason for this is because there's actually a substantial advantage that accrues to a candidate simply by being an incumbent. So we can look at any congressional district and come up with the expected normal vote for a Democratic or Republican candidate using that district's partisan and demographic characteristics. But then if you look at an incumbent, what you would see is that an incumbent member of the House would be expected to perform about 3.6% better on average than the normal vote for their candidate would be. Uh, and a senator would have about a six point boost on top of their expected normal vote. The reasons for this incumbency advantage are a source of discussion within the literature. It's easy to measure though, because you can look at things like how much does a candidate's vote share improve from the first time they are elected to the first time they are reelected, right? Their sophomore surge, we would call it, or how much does their vote share decline when you compare the last vote that the candidate received to the vote that their party's candidate received when running for an open seat, right? So in a retirement slump. Uh, but no matter how you measure it, right, it's very clear that being incumbent gets you an additional boost on top of the vote that you could expect to receive given your district's characteristics. And that makes incumbents very difficult to beat. Fourth point, is that money matters in congressional elections, but not the way that you think. So a lot of people would say that one of the reasons that incumbents win re-election so often is because they are able to raise so much money for their re-election campaigns. That's not necessarily the case. First of all, we need to recognize that understanding the relationship between money and vote share is quite complicated. There's a basic question of causality. Do members of Congress win re-election because they raise a lot of money, or do they raise a lot of money because they are likely to win re-election? Either could be true, and thus to study this is quite difficult for a variety of reasons. But it's plainly clear that spending huge amounts of money does not guarantee re-election. In fact, if we look at the statistical relationship in terms of campaign spending, what we see is that the more incumbents spend, and this is for House elections, that the more incumbents spend, the more likely they are to lose. The more challengers spend, the more likely they are to win. Now, that's not saying that spending is causing an incumbent member to lose, but rather you should recognize that when incumbents are spending high amounts of money, it's reactive. They're doing so because they're facing difficult political conditions, they're responding to a strong challenge, and so their high spending is a sign of weakness. The more challengers spend, though, the better they do. The problem for most challengers is they don't raise enough to be competitive. It takes an extraordinarily high amount of money for a challenger to have a legitimate chance of winning. You need to spend about $700,000 to have a 20% chance of beating an incumbent member in the House of Representatives. $700,000 in campaign spending only gets you a 20% chance of victory. A lot of challengers can't even approach that 700,000 mark, and so then they really don't have a chance at all. You can look at 3,000 elections between 1972 and 2010, and in only one of those elections did a challenger spend less than $100,000 and actually beat an incumbent. Uh, so money matters, but it really is helping challengers, not incumbents. That's the fourth point. Fifth point is don't pin your hopes on first-time candidates. Don't pin your hopes on first-time candidates. So when political scientists are looking at who's a quality candidate, we measure quality in a very simple way, previous elective office experience. And we would look at the level of that office as well. So if it's a Senate candidate and that individual is a former governor, we would expect them to perform better than a Senate candidate who was a town council person, for example. But what we know is that quality challengers, people who have held previous elective office, systematically do better. Right? A quality challenger could be expected to perform about eight points better than a non-quality challenger. And indeed, quality challengers win 25% of the elections they enter, whereas non-quality challengers win only about 5% of the elections they enter. And so you can understand why holding uh, elective office might provide a benefit if I give you a, a simple example. So on campus two weeks ago, 
we hosted visits from two former members of Congress. This was part of the Congress to Campus program, uh, which is a nonprofit organization of former members of Congress. It's a bipartisan program where they send one former Republican member of Congress and one former Democratic member of Congress to campuses across the country. They visit classes, they interview, uh, they conduct interviews with student newspapers, they have dinners and lunches with student groups, and then of course they do public events as well. So one of the members that we hosted was Betsy Markey, who was a Democratic member of the House of Representatives from Colorado, elected in 2008. And she was talking about her first campaign for Congress, and she's beginning to run uh, for office the start of that year in January. And she started by having a party at her house where she asked people who were interested in supporting her to come and say what they would be willing to do, whether they'd be willing to volunteer, give her money, etc. And she told us that she didn't know if anyone would show. She thought she might only have a handful of people willing to come to her house and support her candidacy for Congress. And so how are you then supposed to assemble that organization to run for office in 11 months? If you're a former elected official, then you already know who your campaign donors are. You already know who your volunteers are. You've developed relationships with people you might hire for that campaign. You have higher name recognition within the district because you've already appeared on a ballot. All of those are then explanations why holding previous elective office uh, can be quite an advantage for someone who's trying to uh, accomplish the very difficult task of defeating an incumbent member of Congress. So those are the five things I think you need to know about congressional elections. One, that the president's party always loses seats. Two, that the Republicans have a natural advantage in midterm elections. Three, that it's extremely difficult to defeat an incumbent member of Congress. And four, money matters in congressional elections, but not in the way you think. Five, don't pin your hopes on first time candidates. Uh, and so now I will try to answer questions here. So I have a question here from Christopher Kersey, who's asking what issue or issues do you feel are the most important in this year's midterm election? Well, I think that's somewhat of a difficult question. I think that you clearly see in recent weeks that President Trump has tried to elevate the importance of immigration uh, as a issue in this midterm election. And that's something that I can tell you uh, based on the research into the 2016 presidential election, it played out very well for him. Uh, they developed a very intuitive message on immigration that spoke to a lot of feelings that people within the Republican Party had uh, that other candidates were not necessarily responding to, uh, and that in some ways predicted the support that he received in the Republican primaries. So it appears that's going to be part of the discussion. But what I'd ultimately fall back upon is reminding people that in a midterm election, you're going to see turnout of only about 35 to 40 percent of people, right? These are people who feel strongly about politics, they participate regularly, uh, and for them, they've already made up their minds. Uh, these are going to be people who have strong partisan identities, uh, and, and they're likely to support the candidates that uh, already agree with them on the issues, regardless of what's in the, um, in the atmosphere being discussed at the time. So a lot of people have also talked about the Kavanaugh hearings as being an important issue, and that motivated Republicans to be more enthusiastic about the campaign. And my interpretation would be that uh, campaigns really, uh, and this is using political science language, but they activate people's latent predispositions. And so you had a lot of Republicans who were likely to vote in the midterm election. They were likely to vote for Republican candidates, and maybe that hearing uh, had that effect of making them um, ready to vote and ready to vote for Republican candidates, but something else would have done that if it wasn't the Kavanaugh hearing. They were always likely to participate and they were always likely to vote for a Republican candidate. Now, the way I could be wrong is if turnout is somehow entirely different than we anticipate. And so I was looking at a um, story involving Michael McDonald, who's unfortunately not the Dewey Brothers singer, uh, but Michael McDonald, who's a scholar of turnout, and actually a really important one because he come up, he has come up with this measure of voting eligible population uh, instead of voting age population. And so he statistically corrects for things like removing people who can't vote from the electorate, uh, felons who are disenfranchised by certain laws, uh, including people who can vote but might not be counted, such as military personnel stationed at U.S. installations across the globe. Uh, and so using that statistic, we sometimes see different things in terms of turnout trends. In any event, 
Uh, McDonald is an extremely important scholar of turnout, and he has predicted that we're going to see 45 to 50 percent turnout in this midterm election. Now, I am inherently skeptical of that because that would be the highest turnout that we've seen in 50 years. And so I'm going to assume it's not going to happen until it does. I think probably if thinking probabilistically, that's the, the better way to approach it. But to some extent, maybe that affects my approach as a social scientist. Uh, and I read this once, and I think it's an interesting point that if you think about people who are writing about sports or studying about sports, they're always looking for new things, like Clay Thompson hitting 14 three-pointers last night. And that really impresses people, and they're, they're constantly anticipating that someone might do something new that surprises them. And a lot of people who study politics, they're always looking to the past and expecting that things will always be the same. And I think that's the most likely um, outcome because we've seen 50 years of turnout statistics to say we're not going to have turnout be that high. But I can't entirely discount the possibility that that might not be the case. All right, so I have another question here from Jackie Spritzer. What effect do you think millennial and younger first-time voters may have on the midterms? And unfortunately, uh, for some people, I'll have a, a negative answer here. Uh, and I would say a small effect, a small effect at best. And the two most important predictors of turnout, statistical predictors of turnout, are age and education. The older you are, the more likely you are to vote, uh, and the more educated you are, the more likely you are to vote. And so we regularly see very low levels of participation by people in that 18 to 29 year old range. And that's even when the, the narrative is that younger voters are more engaged. So a lot of the discussion about Barack Obama's election in 2008 was that he had mobilized young voters to participate in a way that they hadn't before. But if you actually look at the data, you would see that turnout among 18 to 29 year olds was only marginally higher uh, than it was in 2004. And if you look at more fine-grained measures in terms of the attention that people paid, uh, young voters paid to that campaign, uh, whether they were likely to be contacted by a candidate and so forth, you didn't really see higher levels of engagement. Uh, and so uh, I, I feel it's unlikely that younger voters are going to turn out at a rate that's um, that's out of the out of the norm. Are there other questions that people might like me to answer? You can type them in now. Okay, so Elizabeth Gass is asking, have, uh, oh sorry, how do you feel social media is affecting this year's election? And so that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, actually, it's something that speaks to my own research interest because I spent, I was on sabbatical last year and I spent that year examining how members of Congress use Instagram. Uh, and so I'm actually the first person who's published on that topic. I have a paper coming out in a, in a month, uh, maybe a little quicker than that, looking at how members use their Instagram accounts, which I do feel is the social media platform of the future, because if you look at user rates for younger Americans, uh, almost all younger Americans are using Instagram, less than 50% uh, are using Twitter. And so I think it's going to become the more important platform. Uh, but to answer the question, uh, I think that uh, the influence of social media is probably going to be um, somewhat nuanced. Uh, in terms of fake news, a lot of people have concerns about fake news. Uh, I don't think that there's any evidence that it had a persuasive effect in the 2016 election. Uh, what we see is that individuals who consume fake news, now the fake news that distributed were dis was distributed on social media overwhelmingly did favor Donald Trump, that is true. Uh, but the people who actually read these stories uh, they were extremely conservative and extremely Republican. And so they read these stories because they confirmed what they already knew to be true. So it was an example of selective exposure, right? Actively seeking out information that confirms your opinions. Uh, and so the idea that people who are likely to vote for Hillary Clinton, uh, they read a story that uh, says that Hillary Clinton was engaged in a pedophilia ring out of a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C., and then that changed their mind, uh, that just, it's not supported by the research that we have. That story would have to be unrealistically persuasive to have that effect. So I think the more likely effect that we see of social media is not a persuasive effect. It's an effect leading people to, to turn out, to be more likely to turn out. And so we do have studies on Facebook and that I voted button, uh, and that has had a small a small effect, but a positive effect. And one thing we know is that personal contact is extremely important in terms of whether people turn out to vote. We know that from experimental work. So individuals who are sending messages on social media to their friends, encouraging them to participate, that can have an effect too. Uh, 
Uh, and so that would be my my answer is that it's unlikely to social media unlikely to persuade people to vote, but may, uh, if used on a personal level, encourage people to cast ballots who wouldn't otherwise. All right, so let me look at these questions again. Going back up, can you comment on voter exclusion and gerrymandering? How they've impacted turnout and the ability of your models to predict outcomes. Uh, and so I do think uh, that there's no question that uh, recently uh, congressional districts have been gerrymandered to favor the Republican Party because the Republican Party has um, controlled more state governments as gerrymandering has accelerated since the court's decision in Baker v. Carr and subsequent decisions, Westbury v. Sanders, uh, Reynolds v. Sims, that declared all state legislative and congressional districts have to be of equal population forcing states that have been malapportioned to constantly redraw their boundaries. And so we can identify states that are gerrymandering using simple measures like lopsided wins. So if you looked at Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania had a uh, congressional delegation that was composed of 13 Republicans and five Democrats until the state Supreme Court threw out that map at the start of the year. And if you look in the 2016 election, those Republicans won their districts by with about 63% of the vote. The Democrats won their districts with about 75, 76% of the vote. And the margin between those two averages is too large to have occurred by chance. Uh, it suggests that Republicans were concentrated, they were packing Democratic votes into a few districts uh, and then creatively drawing the boundaries elsewhere to maximize their chances of winning more districts by smaller margins. But I think the important point is to note that gerrymandering does benefit both parties. There are some states that are still gerrymandered to support the Democratic Party. Uh, and the gerrymandering is really only adding to the Republican advantage that exists on the basis of geography. So again, returning to Pennsylvania, a state that you're all familiar with, it's really hard to draw a map just in general that wouldn't naturally favor the Republican Party because you have concentrations of Democratic votes in Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia and the rest of the state leans Republican. And so if you're using standard practices for districting, that districts have to be drawn respecting existing political uh, and um, community boundaries. Uh, so don't split counties, don't split towns. Districts have to be compact, right, as narrow as possible. They have to be contiguous, uh, so they're not separating territory into different areas. Sometimes that's not possible. You can't draw a New York district involving Staten Island that's fully contiguous, but as much as possible. If you're drawing districts that way, a lot of areas, it's, it's just naturally going to be the case that the map is going to favor the Republican Party because of geography. Uh, and so I think that has to be acknowledged as well. Uh, so I can take one more question. Are there any particular races in Pennsylvania you personally interested in the results of and why? Okay, so I would say, why not Why not the race involving Dickinson College and Carlisle? So Scott Perry is an interesting candidate in that race because although he's an incumbent um, member of Congress, because of the redistricting as a result of the state Supreme Court decision, he's only previously represented about 40% of the constituents uh, in this district. So he's, in some ways, a first-time candidate for um, people who are uh, showing up at the polls, even though he's going to, of course, have higher name recognition. District is about nine point Republican lean, so it's a safe Republican district, but not overwhelmingly so. Uh, and the Democrats have nominated a first time candidate, George Scott, uh, pastor, uh, who has not um, held elective office before, which we now know from this presentation uh, as actually to his detriment. But polled by the New York Times recently, uh, last week, showed that uh, it's in the margin of error. I think the result was 45 to 42 of Harry Lead with a margin of error of four and a half to five points. Um, and so it looks like it's a, it's a close race. I think Scott has run a, a very competitive um, campaign. Uh, his lawn signs are, are everywhere. Uh, and so I think that that's one that would be an interesting race to look at, not just because of the local importance, but also because what it might say uh, about how the parties are doing on November 6th. If Scott goes on to win, that's probably a strong indication that Republicans across the country are having a, a bad night. Uh, so 
Thank you. Uh, it is now 12.30. Thank you for tuning in. Um, again, I'm Professor David O'Connell. You can find me on the Dickinson website on the political science page. Happy to answer any additional questions you might want to email to me uh, directly. Thank you again, uh, and thank you for your support of the college.